All right. So next up, we've got a uh, talk about augmented API de uh, design review uh, by my good buddy, uh, Arnon. So uh, I'll let you jump right into it because we're a little bit yeah. uh, over time. So take it away. Okay, so let me share my screen and start the presentation. And if anything goes wrong, Tony, you have to tell me because I'm totally blind when I start the presentation. Here we are. I hope it works. It should or not. Can you confirm that you uh, see my screen? Yes, it should. OK. Uh, so hello, everyone. I am Arnaud Loret. I'm the author of the Design of Web APIs. You also know me as the uh, API handyman, as Tony said. I'm a senior API architect at uh, Natixis, which is a French group providing banking and financial services. And my job is basically helping IT and business people understand and create APIs. Um, helping people to create APIs implies reviewing API designs, and API design review is a vast topic covering many aspects from pure design concerns to cross-team governance and everything in between. So if you want to learn more about the overall topic, you should look at my API design reviewer status set talk that you can find on my blog. Today, I will focus on uh, my journey to what I call the augmented API design reviewer, which aims to make uh, reviews more efficient, safer, and simpler. I, I will tell you why and how I automate part of API design reviews using the open API specification and spectral YAML and JSON linter. Uh, when people want to create a new API or modify an existing one, its design must be reviewed. And so to do review, I meet the API team, they explain me what they want to do, uh, then they send me their design, I analyze it in depth, uh, we discuss my feedback, I fix the design if needed, and if needed, we cycle. An API design review has three purposes. First, ensuring that the identified needs are the real ones, and ensuring that the design actually fulfills those needs and also possible future ones. Second, ensuring that the design offers a good developer experience, that it is easy to understand, easy to use, and does not underly expose implementation details. And third and last purpose, ensuring that the design has the same look and feel as all of our other APIs, and so making our APIs even more easy to use. But it's done by checking it confirms through our API design guidelines. That sounds like a good plan. So what's the problem with APIs and reviews? Checking conformance to guidelines mean checking that each property name is in lower camel case. Checking that each schema name does not end with some technical suffix such as DTO. Checking each resource path structure. Uh, tracking non-evolvable array of strings among dozens of other checks. Checking confirmance of a small new API or a small modification uh, is done easily in a matter of minutes. But when there are dozens of them, minutes become hours, and there are a significant risk of oversight. Uh, because I'm just an average human being with a limited amount of concentration. And things can get even worse when uh, working on a huge API. Uh, hours can become days, and the question is not will there be oversight when checking guidelines confirmance, but how many? So the problem with API design reviews is uh, succeeding to spend the less possible time on guidelines confirmance, dump checks, and avoid oversights, while spending as much time as possible on tasks actually requiring a human brain, like working on needs and developer experience. And how do we do that? By augmented APIs and reviewers. Um, hopefully we don't have to become cyborgs or machines to be faster and more accurate APIs and reviewers. All that is needed is a machine readable description of APIs and a linter. So forget wiki pages and spreadsheets. Use the open API specification to describe your APIs. The open API specification, formerly known as the Swagger specification, is a standard and programming agnostic 
uh, programming language agnostic REST API description format. Uh, it's uh, an open API document can be either in JSON or in YAML. It describes API resource path, operations, response bodies, anything you need to describe an API. Uh, to describe data, the open API specification relies on a JSON schema, which allows to tell, for example, that a user object is composed of required ID, first name, last name, and an optional address, which type is defined by another schema. Now that we have a readable uh, description of an API, we can analyze it with a program called a link uh, Instead of reinventing the wheel, I use Stoplight Spectral, which uh, Phil talked about, uh, which is an open source uh, linter that can analyze data such as open API specification, but also async documents, uh, Kubernetes configuration files, or any other JSON or YAML data. Linting an open API file with spectral command line interface or CLI is quite simple. Open a terminal, type spectral lint, and uh, followed by the open API file name, and you're done. A spectral is able to detect some problems right out of the box without providing any other information than the API description file. For each problem, we will get its location, uh, its level, the uh, rule that detects the problem, and a human-friendly description. Uh, Spectral comes with a predefined set of rules specifically made to uh, analyze open API documents. And obviously your guidelines are probably not the same as the one uh, bundled in Spectral. But hopefully you can design your own rules in order to check that an API design conforms to your guidelines. A Spectral rule set is a simple YAML file uh, in which you have a rules property, and inside this rules property, you will put your rules, obviously, um, and each rule being identified by its name. A basic rule is composed of three elements. Uh, the given property, which is a JSON path indicating where in the document this rule will be applied. The current value you see here targets the ID property of any reusable schema uh, in the document. The then property describes the controls to be done. Here, the control is applied on field type uh, inside the element found by the uh, given JSON path, and it consists in checking that the, uh, uh, the field type value belongs to an enumeration with a single value string. Uh, enumeration is not the uh, only available function. Spectral comes with some of our you see here. And last but not least property of a basic spectral rule, the description that tells human beings what is happening. And here we say all IG properties must be of type string. So let's run spectral again, but now with our rule set. And so spectral tells us that on line 28 of the open API file, an ID is not of type string. Indeed, uh, in the reusable user schema, the ID property is of type integer instead of string. When I did my first test, uh, I was totally blown and totally convinced that Spectral was a must have to uh, secure and speed up my reviews. Using Spectral looks quite simple at first, but let's now talk uh, about the real world beyond the hello world. Let's talk about how to actually build and then use Spectral rule sets at scale. So it would take a day long workshop to describe all the functions, tips and tricks I use to build spectral rule sets. As I don't have a day for this session, I will focus on the two most important matters that may not obviously come to our mind when using such tool. I will focus on how to design rule sets and how to be sure that they actually work. But still, while talking about these two topics, I may incidentally share some tips, but without going deep into details, uh, I, st I write a post series on my blog to share all that, so stay tuned. Uh, so, just like an API, a spectral rule sets actually need to be designed. You can't just start from scratch and write random rules one after another. You need to think, you need to have a plan. So, if you don't already have API design guidelines, write them, at least the minimal version that you will expand when needed. Look at my Lord of API design talk to learn more about that. Once you're done, you can start to express your design uh, guidelines as spectral rules. But do not rush blindly. Just like when you uh, represent jobs to be done as a REST API, you have to think about what you, what you are doing. You must ensure that your raw design is actually relevant, user-friendly, and maintainable. 
So to do so, you obviously have to think about names, rule names, and descriptions. But choosing adapted rule granularity, severity, and organization is even more essential. So let's talk about granularity first. If our guidelines say that all responses are objects, and that a get slash whatever slash plural name return a list. And this list is represented as an object containing a recurrent property named items, which is an array, the list of resources. And each item in this list must be an object. And when the response is a list, the return object may contain a page property that must, be, uh, that must provide the current page and the total number of pages. To check all that, with spectral, we could create a single rule, let's name it valid, valid collection schema. Uh, and the description would tell that the list must conform to our guidelines with a very long but a specific description of what is expected. It would target schema of 200 responses of get response of path ending by a plural noun, thanks to some magic regex filter. And eventually, in the then close, we could use the schema function that checks a data structure and conforms to a given JSON schema. And so we could provide the schema function, the JSON schema of the expected JSON schema of the response. There's a huge tip here. So what happens if we run this rule on this document, which uh, contains a get slash user returning an array of user? Spectral detects the problem, but what is the problem exactly? Is there a mistake on the pagination data? Is something? Is there something? Uh, another problem with the items which are objects? We don't know. Maybe by if we had some uh, uh, description into the message, we can have the uh, original description, the path of the error, and the error itself. Okay, so Spectral tells us that. Uh, the user schema is missing a property named properties. Okay, what, what can we do with that? If, if we are not uh, expert of the guidelines, spectral rules, JSON schema, and open API specification, we can do anything with that. The rule is too coarse grain. We need to split it in smaller ones, focusing on each individual aspect defined in our guidelines. And so we run spectral with our new, uh, more accurate rule set. Now we have an explicit uh, description of the problem. The response return should be an object. It should be a list encapsulated in an object. And now the designer can simply uh, uh, fix the design to uh, match the guidelines. In my examples, we only have seen warnings, but a spectral rule uh, can have different uh, severities. And here's how I use them. Error, that's an actual error. It must be fixed without any discussion, like a 204 no content returning data. Warning, it looks like an error, but it can be normal. Fix it if needed. For example, um, a post request uh, without any required property is usually not normal, but sometimes it is. Info, it's a possible improvement. For example, hey, what about adding pagination or what about adding search filters to this get slash whatever slash plural name which returns the list? Hint, that's an element that needs to be discussed by API design reviewers and the API team. For example, uh, the use of content type other than application slash JSON that may require a specific design and implementation because files shouldn't go through our API gateways. That way, and especially using the hint level, I know where I have to focus my investigations and discussions. And finally, in order to be uh, user-friendly, but most importantly, be maintainable, you have to organize your rules in various full set, just like you would organize a function with various libraries. I currently, I have 71 rules organized in 10 different rule sets. Rules are organized based on what they test. Each rule set can be used individually, uh, for example, if I just want to check security aspects, like uh, two operations are covered by at least uh, one or of two scope, I obviously use my security rule set. But if I want to use all my rule sets, I have a main rule set that includes all the other ones, thanks to the extends property, which is a list of paths to other local or remote rule sets. 
As you can see, you can end with many rule sets containing many rules, some of them being quite simple, but some of them being terribly complex because they use schema validation, uh, regex, uh, JSON path. So how to be sure that all of this actually works? As usual, by testing. And here's a summary of the various test strategy I use uh, during my journey as I was learning Spectral. At the very beginning, I had a single rule set. I created a single test open API file to check that all my rules were actually working. As the number of rules grew, it became a nightmare because it was really hard to add new use case inside the use of open API file and manually check uh, spectral output. So uh, I split my rule set into smaller ones. Uh, and so splitting my rule set was not only dictated by uh, the need of just organize, organizing rule, it was also dictated by the need of uh, simplified testing. But even after splitting uh, my rule sets and my big open API file into a smaller one, it was still painful to add new use case and manually check the, re the response of spectral for each rule set. Hopefully, Spectral uh, is also available as a Node.js library. Therefore, I created a Mocha unit test uh, unit test suite to uh, and use the Spectral library in that. I created one test file for each rule set, still using my uh, Open API files for each rule set, and I programmatically checked that I get the expected problems. That was better because I realized that some of my rules were actually not working at all. But even if it was better. Using a single open API file for each root set and so testing all rules at once was too complex and prone to errors. That's why I got a level deeper in my testing strategy. I decided to test each rule in isolation with a dedicated input for each test. To do that, I tinkered with the result of uh, the spectral parser to only keep a specific rule active and deactivate all the others when running a test. I also managed to be able to uh, use partial open API documents instead of complete ones, making writing tests easier. As the number of rules and rule sets was growing, I was fearing to, uh, to forget testing some of them. So I had it checks to ensure that I had a test suite for each rule set. And inside each test suite, I, uh, I check that uh, each rule has been called at least once. Uh, it's not perfect, but at least it works so far. Uh, also, as my testing became more and more accurate, I realized that some rules were uh, not working because the uh, JSON path in my given clause were totally wrong. So I got another level deeper, and instead of testing each rule as a whole, I did dedicated tests uh, for the given clause of each rule to ensure that they were actually hitting what was expected and they were not hitting wrong targets. Uh, to do those tests, I tinkered again inside the result of a spectral parser to retrieve the given JSON path. And then I used the JSON path plus uh, node library, which is used by spectral and hood. And uh, I use it on some JSON input to check that I get what was expected. But the level uh, of given close testing depends on its complexity, on the JSON path complexity. If there are no filters, I just check that I get what I want on simple example. But if there are re complex regex filters, I do uh, specific checks for each one. And that way I'm sure that um, I get exactly what I need. And I also check that uh, what is supposed to be ignored is actually ignored. After all these evolutions, uh, writing tests for my rules and rule set became quite simple. Uh, uh, the test suite name tells uh, my spectral wrapper uh, which will set to load automatically. Then the sublevel test suite name tells the wrapper which will be tested, and so it activates only this one and deactivates all the others. And then I have four basic checks. I check that uh, the given expression actually finds something, that the given expression actually ignores specific elements, that the rules actually returns error when needed and do not return error when needed. And in the end, I check that all rules have been tested. I have no more than 400 uh, tests to check my 71 rules. And that makes me confident. Uh, so I don't need to double check that, uh, what has been uh, checked by Spectral. 
And I also, uh, I'm able to design new rules very quickly. So let's sum up what we have seen about the design of spectral rule set. First, create your guidelines. Then, uh, when you design your rule set, ensure user friendliness and maintainability by choosing adapted granularity, severity, and organization. And on top of that, test your rule set, that you would test code. Once you have a minimal rule set, start to use it immediately. Do not wait to cover your rule guidelines. Using Spectral in your uh, design and review process as soon as possible will help you to improve your rules and Spectral skills. It may also give you a, a few ideas about how to use Spectral in your review process. So when I do uh, API design reviews, I use Spectral in three different ways. When I receive an API contract for review, I use the CLI to get a quick check, uh, to do a quick check and see how many problems there are. Uh, if I need to go quickly from one problem to another on a file, I open it in Stoplight Studio. I, as Steve, uh, Phil said, it's a GUI with both OpenAPI and Spectral support. Also use it for uh, design, but that's another story. Uh, to make my rules available in Studio, I just need to add a .spectral.yml file project and then reference my main rule set directly targeting uh, the Git repository. And so, tada, I get the errors coming from my rule set, and I just have to click on each one of them to go directly uh, to the source of a problem in the uh, OpenAPI file. But all this only works when there are not so many problems. If there are hundreds of errors, and that happens when I do a uh, review on huge old APIs, uh, the output of the CLI and the rendering in Studio is not very really usable for me. I need to get uh, another view. Um, uh, stats to know what are the different categories of problem in order to make a summarized review uh, that will be the input for a design workshop. Uh, hopefully, the CLI can output its result as JSON. And so I pipe this result into JQ, which is a command line JSON processor. You can do crazy stuff uh, with that. Uh, you can check my blog. There is a series about this tool. So I get the JSON output of Spectral put it into GQ and transform it into CSV to import it into a good old spreadsheet. And then I can do uh, sorting, filtering, uh, get stats to prepare my workshop. So this session was quite intense and all this is only a brief summary of how you spectral. I use it now on all of my reviews. It really helped me to make more accurate, exhaustive, consistent and faster review. And this is only the beginning. I will start to provide my rule sets to API designers. I have many other ideas around this tool. So what should you retain from this session? Using machine readable API description and API description linter gives excellent reviews when uh, results when reviewing uh, API design. But you need to work on your rule set design and testing to actually get both results. Uh, obviously, a linter will not replace human being when reviewing API design. It will not tell you if the design is accurate uh, to fulfill some needs, but it will save your time to actually focus on that. It will save your time by making guidelines conformance check faster and reduce oversight. It will uh, give you an overview of the stylistic quality of an API. It will even give you some hints about things that you should discuss with API design team. And we're done. I hope uh, you enjoyed this session. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. I don't know if there, are, if there is time for questions. There's, there's no time for questions, although I have like Sorry, questions about He-Man for you that we can, we'll have to talk on Twitter about that. Yeah. Uh, but we'll, we'll make sure to get you the questions uh, that are okay. in the chat. Uh, thank there. you so much. Uh, okay. Yeah. I'll be there in the chat to answer all your questions. So thank you, Tony. Thank you, everyone. Great. Thank you so much. Fantastic talk there. That was awesome. And man, I have to say, so jealous of all of those He-Man figures. I, ah, I'm just so envious, man.